Gravitational fields are a type of force field. A gravitational field is the area within which the non-contact force due to mass can exert its influence. All masses exert a gravitational pull on the objects around them. The force is only noticeable, however, when the mass of at least one of the objects is very large. Gravitational force is only ever attractive. When drawing a gravitational field, therefore, all the field lines are directed towards the center of the mass. The strength of a gravitational field increases with proximity to the surface of the mass. This is clear from the diagram on the previous screen, as the field lines are closer near the surface. In quantitative terms, gravitational field strength at a point is the gravitational force per unit mass acting at that point. The units of gravitational field strength are newtons per kilogram. This is dimensionally equivalent to meters per second per second. Newton proposed that there is a recognizable relationship which can be stated for the gravitational attraction between two point masses. This is known as Newton's law of gravitation. The law states that any two bodies attract each other with a force that is proportional to each of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Because the force due to gravity is always attractive, it is common to denote this by placing a negative sign at the beginning of the formula. The value of the gravitational constant can be calculated using experimental data by rearranging the formula. If we consider the Earth as an example of a point mass, assuming that it is a perfect sphere with a uniform gravitational field, we can examine how the gravitational field strength varies as it gets further away from the center of the Earth. Outside the Earth's surface, the gravitational force obeys the inverse square law. Acceleration due to gravity is inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the center of the Earth. When discussing bodies falling close to the Earth's surface, we take g as a constant, as r doesn't vary very much. This value for g is approximate, given the minor changes of r around the Earth, and is known as the acceleration of free fall. The gravitational potential at a point is defined as being equal to the work done in bringing unit mass from infinity to that point. This tells us the potential energy per kilogram of mass. If we assume the Earth to be spherical and of uniform density, we can treat it as if its total mass is concentrated at an infinitesimally small point at its center. The force of attraction on unit mass outside the Earth is gm over r squared, where r is the distance from the center. As work done equals force multiplied by distance, the work done in moving a distance delta r is gm delta r over r squared. The gravitational potential at this point is therefore minus gm over r. The units of gravitational potential are joules per kilogram. The potential energy of a mass at a point is equal to the gravitational potential at that point multiplied by the mass. The gradient of a graph of gravitational potential against distance is equal to the gravitational field strength at that point. Gravitational potential increases as the distance of the object from the mass increases. Weight, F, is the effect of a gravitational field on a mass. It is measured in newtons. Outside a spherical mass, all points at distance r from the center have the same gravitational potential. Effectively, all of these points lie on a sphere of radius r known as an equipotential surface. Satellites are kept in orbit 
by their gravitational attraction to the body around which they are traveling. Once man-made satellites are in orbit, they no longer require engines to keep them moving. The radius of the satellite's orbit depends on its speed rather than its mass. It is possible to calculate the period of a body's orbit by using the formula velocity equals distance over time. It therefore makes sense that t equals s over v, or for a body moving with circular motion at constant speed, t equals 2 pi r over v. Electric fields are the result of the electromagnetic force exerted by a charge. They are an example of a force field, and like gravitational fields, they can be represented by field lines. The area the field covers is the area within which the non-contact force of an electric current can exert its influence. The direction of the field lines is the direction in which a small positive charge would move if placed at that point. An electromagnetic force can only exist between two objects if they have charge. The force exerted on a charged body in an electric field depends on the body's charge and the electric field strength. The electric field strength at a point is defined as the force per unit positive charge placed at that point. The unit of electric field strength is therefore newtons per coulomb, as potential difference is defined as work done per unit charge. We can also say that electric field strength is measured in volts per meter. In 1785, Coulomb showed that the force between two point charges is proportional to each of the charges and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. This is known as Coulomb's law. The force exerted by an electrostatic charge can be attractive or repulsive, as there are two types of charge, positive and negative. Without exception, like charges repel and unlike charges attract. The constant of proportionality for Coulomb's law, K, is written as shown here, where epsilon naught is the permittivity of free space, providing the changes are in a vacuum. For the purposes of this section, this is always assumed. This constant can be substituted into the previous equation so that the following is true. If a small test charge, Q, is placed at distance r away from a point charge, Coulomb's law can be used to calculate the force acting on Q. As E equals F over Q, the electric field strength of a point charge in free space or air can also be calculated. Apart from at the very edges, the electric field between parallel plates is uniform. Field lines in close proximity to each other indicate a strong electric field. The electric potential of a point in an electric field is defined as the work done in bringing unit positive charge from infinity to that point. Electric potential is measured in joules per coulomb or volts. Electric potential can be positive or negative because forces due to charges can be attractive or repulsive. Lines, surfaces or volumes which have the same potential along them are known as equipotentials. In a uniform electric field, 
the field strength is equal to the potential gradient at that point. This tells us that the electric field strength can also be measured in volts per meter. Fields are used to explain interaction between objects which are not in direct contact. A force field is the area within which a non-contact force can exert its influence. There are four basic types of interaction commonly discussed in physics. Gravitational, electrical, magnetic and nuclear. In literal terms, force fields do not exist. They are merely a conceptual aid to enable us to visualize the bizarre phenomenon of interaction between objects which are not in direct contact. The force of interaction between two similar objects is discussed in terms of field strength, and the energy is measured by the potential. Field strength and potential are concepts which are present when contemplating any type of force field. As a result, there are many points of similarity between electric and gravitational fields.
Magnetic fields are a type of force field. The field denotes the area in which the non-contact force of permanent magnets or current-carrying conductors can exert their influence. The magnetic field of bar magnets is concentrated mainly at the ends or poles. Convention states that the arrows show the direction in which a small north pole would move if placed at that point. Stronger forces are denoted by an increased density of field lines. The magnetic field around a bar magnet is not uniform. One cannot define magnetic field strength as force per unit magnetic pole, as is possible with gravitational or electric fields, because magnetic poles always exist in pairs. A different approach is therefore necessary to define it. At the beginning of the 19th century, Oersted discovered that the magnetic field around a current-carrying conductor is circular. Maxwell formulated a rule to tell us the direction of these field lines. It's commonly referred to as the corkscrew rule, as the lines are in the direction one would turn a corkscrew pointing in the direction of the current. Another way of remembering this direction is the right-hand grip rule. If the right hand is held so that the thumb follows the direction of the current, the tips of the fingers will point in the direction of the field lines around a current-carrying conductor. The magnetic field of a solenoid is similar to that of a bar magnet, so we can say that it has poles. The current flows clockwise at the south pole and anticlockwise at the north. When considering magnetic field strength instead of discussing the force on a magnetic pole, the force on a current carrying conductor is used. When placed in a magnetic field, a current carrying conductor experiences a force due to the interaction between the two magnetic fields. The force on a conductor is always perpendicular to the plane containing the conductor and the direction of the field in which it is placed. Quantitatively, Magnetic field strength is called magnetic flux density. This tells us the force acting per unit current in a wire of unit length at right angles to the field. The unit of magnetic flux density is the Tesla. Only component X of the wire's length experiences the maximum force. Basic trigonometry is used to calculate this length. The direction of the force can be easily deduced using Fleming's left-hand rule. If two of the fingers are lined up in the direction of the two quantities of which the direction is known, the direction of the third quantity is indicated by the remaining digit. It is important that the second finger is pointed in the direction of conventional rather than actual current. Charges moving through magnetic fields which are perpendicular to the direction of their travel also experience a force. This is because moving charge is current, which thanks to the work of Oersted, we know to have a magnetic effect. Fleming's left-hand rule can be used to find the direction of the force on a moving charge. The force on a moving charge is given by the formula F equals BQV. If the charge's motion is not perpendicular to the field, F equals BQV sine theta. Because the force on a moving charge in a magnetic field is always perpendicular to the velocity, the charge will follow a circular path. The radius of the charge's circle can therefore be calculated using this formula.
Magnetic flux is different to magnetic flux density. The field lines drawn around a magnet represent the magnetic flux flowing from the north to the south pole. Magnetic flux tells us the number of flux lines there are, whereas magnetic flux density tells us the number of flux lines there are per unit area. It is therefore valid to say that magnetic flux is the product of magnetic flux density and area when the flux is at 90 degrees to the area. The unit of magnetic flux is the Weber. When a wire cuts across the flux lines of a magnet, the flux lines link it by flowing through it. This is known as flux linkage. Moving into or out of the field changes the flux linkage and induces a current. If a coil has more than one turn, the flux through the whole coil is equal to the sum of the flux of the individual turns. When flux lines are cut by a conductor, an EMF is induced which will cause a current to flow. Lenz's law states that the direction of the induced EMF opposes the change that caused it. This is a perfect example of the principle of conservation of energy. The current induced in the wire sets up a force on the magnet which must be overcome by the magnet's mover. The work done in moving the magnet therefore provides the electrical energy of the current. A current is only induced when there is a change in the amount of flux linking a coil. Because a conductor is not always part of a complete circuit, the induced current cannot always simply flow. Instead, the negative charge collects at one end of the conductor, leaving the other end positively charged. A potential difference has been established across the ends of the conductor, making it a source of electrical energy. We say that an EMF has been induced. An EMF is induced when flux lines are cut by a moving conductor. Faraday's law states that the magnitude of the induced EMF in a conductor is proportional to the rate at which the magnetic flux is cut by the conductor. Factors which affect the magnitude of the induced EMF are the strength of the magnet, the number and proximity of the coils on the solenoid, and the speed with which the flux lines are cut. Increasing the magnitude of any or all of these factors will increase the magnitude of the induced EMF.
Electromagnetic induction is widely used to generate electricity. An AC generator is essentially a rectangular coil placed between the poles of a horseshoe magnet. Each end of the coil is connected to a slip ring. Contact brushes pressed against the slip rings ensure continuous contact between the alternator coil and the rest of the circuit. If the coil turns at a steady rate, the flux through the coil is continually changing. There is therefore an alternating EMF across the terminals. The induced EMF is at a peak when the sides of the coil cut right across the field lines as in diagrams A and C. In diagrams B and D, when the sides of the coil are parallel to the field lines, the induced EMF is zero. Apart from generation of electricity, there are many other applications of electromagnetic induction. One of the most common of these is in transformers, which are a fundamental component of the national grid. Transformers are used for stepping up or stepping down alternating voltages. They are made of two coils around a soft iron core. An alternating current in the primary coil produces a changing magnetic field, which induces an EMF in the secondary coil. Transformers only work with AC power supplies because the alternating current is equivalent to moving a bar magnet repeatedly in and out of a coil.